Good morning. It is uh, officially 9 o'clock. And, uh, you know, as you all know, this is Military City USA. And uh, I know there are a lot of veterans, and we, um, we really like to... Uh, come on in, Chief. Grab a seat. Grab a seat for you right there. like to start on time to respect your time and I want to thank so many of you who got here early. <clears throat> I want to thank you for joining uh, us at this town hall that is designed to make sure that we do everything we can to reduce and hopefully eliminate the potential of fraud and abuse of our nation's senior citizens. And uh, this morning we're going to be sharing ideas, answer questions, and be available to hear your feedback, your questions, your concerns. Before I get started, uh, I mentioned uh, Military City USA. At this time, I would like for anyone who has served in the armed forces or had a loved one who served, because when the veteran serves, the whole family serves. So if you would uh, choose to stand up or just raise your hand, let us recognize you for your service to our country. and your dedication, willingness to sacrifice everything for a cause greater than yourself, that's what makes this country great. I'd also like to honor those who've made the ultimate sacrifice and aren't here with us today. We owe them our love, our pride, our gratitude for defending our nation and our freedom. And that includes uh, men and women in armed services, but also our first responders. And. Uh, the men and women that the chief and the sheriff lead every day, um, they sign up to protect and defend. And uh, every night, every day, their loved ones want to come home safe, and we appreciate them being out there taking care of us. So if you are a widow, widower, a surviving child, uh, please know that we appreciate your family's sacrifice for our country. We salute you, and we thank you. Today we're holding this town hall meeting so that we can provide you with important information on how to recognize and protect uh, yourself and loved ones from fraud. Our senior citizens, their friends, caregivers, and relatives should be aware of many of the fraud schemes and learn what to do when they become targets of this deceitful and dangerous activity. And one of the things I want to I want to start with before I introduce our guest speakers. Whether you are a senior, soon to be a senior, because hopefully we're all going to be seniors one day, but whether you are currently or you are here because you take care of a loved one who is. Yesterday I, uh, I spent the day driving my 79-year-old mother-in-law around town so that I could put her CPS, her SAWS, her mortgage, her homeowners, and all her bills on, on auto draft. And I wanted to make sure it got done, and it was done right, and, I, and during the drive, at one point, my mother-in-law started to feel bad and started to be, get down on herself. And I said, why are you upset with yourself? She said, I used to handle all of this so easily. I take care of everybody, the whole family, everyone. I said, but you know, you didn't bring this on yourself. This is just something that's happened. So if you... Uh, if you, if you are with a loved one who starts to beat themselves up just because they may not be able to remember something because they thought they paid a bill because something happened, just remind them this is not their fault. Remind them that they're not defective. Remind them that they're just as valuable as they've always been. And they still have a lot to offer. Um, it frustrates me. And it frustrates me too that I know that there are a lot of seniors who won't call in uh, when they've been taken advantage of because they don't want to be embarrassed, they don't want to feel stupid, they don't want to, they don't want to be judged. And so uh, what hopefully we gain from today is not only uh, what are the dangers that are out there, but how do we help hold our loved ones' hands and help them through the process? Because this is a process. And I, I believe very, very seriously that uh, societies are judged by how we treat those who, 
can no longer uh, defend themselves. And so, and, and you know, I believe we are an excellent, and wonderful city. That, that what makes our city so <coughs> incredible is the heart that we have, and that's what we give to our state and our nation. I'm going to present our guest speakers and give them a few minutes to introduce themselves and the work that they do to address elder fraud. Uh, starting here with the first person seated at my right is our Bear County Sheriff, Javier Salazar. Javier, would you like to uh, say a few things? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm Sheriff Javier Salazar. Uh, I've been your Bear County Sheriff for almost three years now, and prior to that I had the, the honor of serving at the San Antonio Police Department for about 23, almost 24 years. Uh, let me start over. <laughs> Y'all hear me? I had, I had the honor of serving at the sheriff, at the uh, SAPD for about 23, almost 24 years, um, and saw things change quite a bit. <laughs> saw things change. Stepped up. Stepped up. Amen. Okay, <laughs> Three years as your Bear County Sheriff. Prior to that, 23, almost 24 years with the San Antonio Police Department. Over those years, I've seen the landscape of our not only our county but the way. Criminals attack our county, change in many different ways. And one of the things that we've seen, a disturbing trend that we've seen over the years, uh, is senior fraud. Uh, there is entire, there's an entire industry out there, whether you believe it or not, there's an entire industry out there designed to target you as our senior community and separate you from the money that you've worked so hard for for your entire life, your entire career. And it's our job to make sure that we're working proactively to prevent that from happening. And so hopefully uh, you'll take some information from here today that you can use, you can put it in the toolbox, and at, at some point in the future, although we hope and pray that you'll never need it, you'll have this information with you that you'll be able to help protect yourself. So it's, it's my uh, honor to be here today, and I appreciate uh, the Senator's efforts uh, in inviting us out and continuing to keep this conversation going. Thank you. His right is the South Texas District Director of Texas Adult Protective Services, Ann Cortez. Ann, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator, and good morning, everyone. I work with Adult Protective Services. I have been doing this for uh, well over 30 years of my life. We are responsible for investigating abuse, neglect, and exploitation of our seniors, 65 and over, and our um, physically... Um, and mentally incapacitated adults 18 and over. We are charged with um, ensuring that they're free from, from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. In many instances, providing services to remedy instances of abuse, neglect, and exploitation um, in, in our community. I will say that here in Bear County, we received over 9,000 cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation um, last fiscal year, second to uh, only to Harris County. So it is a growing problem. I echo the sheriff's uh, concerns and also the senator's concerns with respect to um, services and, and allegations of abuse being underreported as well uh, and for the reasons that the senator mentioned. Um, I am honored to be here and I'm looking forward to uh, working collaboratively with the panel to address the issues of abuse, neglect, and exploitation here in this community. I invited some of our Adult Protective Services staff, they're in purple, uh, so if um, during this presentation or after the presentation there are specific issues that uh, you'd like to address, our staff is here to serve you. Thank you. What I think you heard, and I want to thank Ms. Cortez, the folks in purple, would you all stand for just a second? Everyone who's in purple shirt. They work for the state of Texas. That means they work for all of you. They, uh, and they're here to answer your questions. So if you have a private question about something, is this abuse, is it not abuse, what constitutes abuse, what is fraud, what is it, how do I report it, ask them right after the meeting. If you, don't. If you have a specific case that you don't want to speak uh, publicly, is that correct? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Next, uh, a, a dear friend, and many of us are listening to uh, Some of us remember him as Judge Kazin. Uh, he's now first assistant uh, district attorney. The, our district attorney, Joe Gonzalez, had a family emergency, and he sent us uh, his right-hand person, uh, someone I've known for many, many years, 
And I told uh, Phil or Judge Kazin when he when he was coming up that I was glad he was here because now we have a, a current judge and a former judge that gave us some insight into what's going on. So would you like to introduce yourself? I would. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Case, and I am uh, honored to serve as uh, your elected district attorney, Joe Gonzalez's first assistant. And uh, before I took that position in January of this year, I served for 20 years as a criminal district court judge and saw a number of fraud and abuse cases come through the court. So we're uh, very familiar with uh, those types of issues. There are a couple of there are a number of people that we brought from the district attorney's office today, and I just want to introduce a couple of them. Uh, some of you who may have had <coughs> cases pending in the district attorney's office as complainants uh, may be familiar with the idea that uh, the prosecutors, the individual prosecutors that you typically deal with, are very often in court. Uh, it's sad to say that uh, San Antonio Bear County is is probably one of the most uh, one of the busiest criminal jurisdictions. Uh, in the state. Uh, and so often the prosecutor that you're used to dealing with is down in court dealing with uh, uh, your cases and other cases, cases of other folks uh, who have come through the system as complainants and victims. Uh, and so more often than not, when you call the district attorney's office to talk about your particular case, uh, you will deal with what we, what is in essence a liaison between our office, our prosecutors in the office, and the victims who are uh, who we are representing in court, those liaisons are called victim advocates, and uh, our chief victim advocate is uh, here with us today. She is probably, in my opinion, uh, the best in the state. Uh, she's been recognized uh, statewide, certainly is treasured by our office, and I want to introduce her to you so that uh, you can get to know her uh, and maybe visit with her after uh, the talkback session is over, and Cindy Yan is here from our office, and she's our... Uh, just wave, or you can stand if you want. She is so, she hates, she hates publicity in the media. But anyway, so if you have any questions about um, our office and uh, what the victim advocates do and how they can help you if you ever, God forbid, have a case in the district attorney's office as a complainant, uh, Cindy is the person to talk to. We also have one of our uh, senior or lead prosecutors. He's in what we call the Special Crimes Division of the District Attorney's Office, specializing in elder fraud and abuse cases. Uh, and his name is Brandon Jackson. And Brandon, if you would stand. Uh, I will tell you that for the last 20, now 21 years, um, and really for the last 30 years, I spent uh, about eight and a half years before I took the bench in the district attorney's office as a frontline prosecutor trying these types of cases and violent crime cases, uh, then spent 20 years on the bench and now I'm back in the district attorney's office in the, as an administrator. Uh, and I will tell you that, um, I, maybe I shouldn't share this with you, but I will. Uh, I, <laughs> I had a very comfortable life as a senior judge and uh, would not have left that job, uh, would not have left that job uh, except for one person. I would not have gone back to the district attorney's office or done anything else with my career except for one person, and that is your elected district attorney, Joe Gonzalez. Uh, Joe's been my one of my best friends for about 30 years. I could not be prouder of the initiatives that he has created uh, just in the short 10 months that we've been in office. Uh, and he is concentrating on uh, violent crime, crimes against children, and crimes against the elderly. And I can tell you that we are all in that office committed to making sure that you are safe and that your community is safe, that our community is safe. Because at the end of the day, it is our community. We're not just neighbors. We are family here in Bear County, and we are here to protect you. And thank you for allowing us to be here. And Senator, thank you for allowing us to be here. So, uh, next uh, judge, I want to introduce the Honorable Judge Veronica Vasquez of Probate Court Number 2. She has been in contact with our office and, and for a long time said, I'd like to do something. Can we work on something? And I want to thank you uh, for constantly be thinking about ways that we can help the community. And it's been a pleasure to work with you. Please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Senator Menendez, for inviting me to this. I just... My name is Veronica Vasquez, and if you have gone to the Doris Griffin Senior Center, you probably have seen me, because I used to work for Catholic Charities, and I used to give presentations there every couple of months about wills, powers of attorneys, guardianships. Well, now I'm a judge in that particular court. So I'm the probate court judge for probate court number two. 
And what we deal with, and what we see a lot of, of course, is the probating of wills, things like that, but we also see a lot of guardianship cases. And a lot of APS removal cases go through my court. So what does that mean? If someone is suspected of, of being abused or neglect or exploited, the good people of APS, they get that phone call, they will then come to my court and after they've done and they've said, yes, this person is needs to be removed from this home or needs to be removed from the situation, they will then come to my court for an emergency removal. And so I see a lot of those cases. Unfortunately, I'm seeing more and more of those cases, um, again, because we have a population that is becoming more elderly and we're living a lot longer and so we're seeing a lot of those cases. I also do a lot with guardianship cases. So sometimes we think it could be that nice person that's, you know, uh, befriending someone that has lost all their family members. But unfortunately, sometimes it's also a lot of family members that do this, right? And so we will get a lot of guardianship cases where we have loved ones that come in and say, you know, my, my mother is being abused or neglected or exploited by another family member, and they're there to try to protect their loved one and get guardianship over their loved one. I will say, though, that if you haven't had an opportunity to get a power of attorney, please do that now. Oh, if you're over the age of 65, Catholic Charities does it for free. For free. doesn't matter how much money you make. So please get that done because in a time of crisis, if someone's taking advantage of you, someone's you know saying that you know you can if you give them a thousand dollars that they could turn into ten thousand dollars or whatever the scam is, if you have that loved one that has is your agent, they may be able to fix those things for you. Sometimes it becomes a lot harder when you don't have that, and then you have to end up in probate court. So that's a lot of what I do um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and I still give presentations, and I still go out and speak to the <coughs> centers, so if you need that as well, let me know. But I'm here to support. Um, I'm working in conjunction with Senator Menendez. Yes, sir. Quick, Judge, real quick, on that power of attorney, that can be anyone. It can be uh, a child. It can be a sister. It can be anyone they trust. Right? That anybody that you trust, and the key word is trust, because sometimes we see people that are appointed as agents, and they abuse that power. So you want to make sure that, and I tell people, don't appoint that son, that our daughter, that lives on the couch, that's never had a job, that's been in and out of jail. And no matter how much you love me, hold, right? No matter how much you love me, hold, you have to, you have to appoint somebody you know and trust. It could be a friend, it could be a neighbor, it could be your pastor, it could be whoever you know and trust that will not exploit you or abuse you, okay? Um, but I am working in conjunction with Senator Menendez, and tomorrow we're having our first task force meeting to talk about these issues and to have an open line of communication so we can ensure these, these APS cases get prosecuted. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to be here, and our office is a resource. If you ever, ever have any questions, please contact my court. And again, I'm probate court number two. I always tell everybody, Veronica Vasquez, B squared, probate court number two. So if you ever need anything, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. So before the mic goes to the person, yes, let's give her a hand. Um, being told that these mics, you have to hold them very close. The, the ones with the green lights all are on and should work, but you have to be like almost you know, in eating the thing. Uh, the next person is from the Financial Crimes Unit, uh, the Director, Lieutenant Marcus Booth. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Marcus Booth, SAPD Financial Crimes. I'll be brief. Uh, I just want you to understand that I look forward to, and, and we have great partnerships with the DA's office and Adult Protective and, and the legal system. Uh, so we appreciate the opportunity to work together with everybody. Uh, my partner, Sergeant Paul Castillon, over here is with me this morning. Uh, we'll stick around here. There you go. There you go. Uh, and, and we both work on a lot of these complex financial, uh, legal matters, criminal matters. Uh, we'll participate in the discussion, obviously, but if anybody wants to talk after we get done, uh, we'll, we'll stick around and... Uh, Appreciate the opportunity, so thank you, Senator. Senator. Appreciate that very much. And the next person does not need an introduction, San Antonio. He's uh, he's been a great chief of police, and uh, he's, he's he's someone who's also there for all of us, and uh, a friend, and and you know he and his wife and their kids are, are just members of the community, and a good friend, uh, Chief of Police William McManus. Thank you, Senator. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, uh, I asked Lieutenant Booth to come with me today because he is down in the trenches with the sergeant and they can answer the, the, the tough questions and the detailed questions that I may not be able to. So they're here for that. And let me, just a quick story. So I was in uh, gyms, and this was maybe a year ago. I was in gyms for a breakfast meeting and I don't know how the waiter knew, but the waiter said to me when they handed me the check, do, do you want your senior discount? 
<laughs> so, I, I became a senior a couple years ago. Uh, and you know what? I'm just waiting for somebody to try and exploit me. <laughs> I'm just waiting. But, uh, you know, several years ago, we started a uh, elder, elder crimes unit within uh, the White Collar Division uh, of CID, Criminal Investigation Division. So, um, it's that important to us, and, and it became that important because we saw the crimes on the rise. And whenever there's a, a, uh, a uh, say, a property crime that's committed against an elderly uh, person, a senior, that case will go to white collar to be assigned to the uh, um, elderly crimes uh, unit, so or unit in, within... Uh, White collar. So um, we do pay special attention to that. We do understand the, the complexities of it and the, uh, the serious nature of it. And that's why we, we've designated uh, those types of offenses being investigated by a special unit. So we're here for you. Uh, as the lieutenant said, we'll be here after the meeting to answer any kind of uh, particular situations that you might need to ask about. So thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, let me give you like uh, sort of the ground rules of how this is going to work. Um, you got a question, Senator? We have a question. Please go right ahead. Question for the panel. Well, man, let me lay out the rules first, and then we'll get into it. <laughs> and that way, we can all ask questions. Okay. That way, I, I have. So here's what we have. We have a couple of questions that have already been collected from the seniors at the senior centers. We're going to give the panel an opportunity to respond. Then what we were thinking is we take a very small break to let people go to the restroom, get some refreshments. When we come back, we're going to open the discussion to Q&A from the audience so that you tell them what's going on. At this time, I'd like to thank the executive director for the, uh, of NowCast, Charlotte and Lucas, for being here. Charlotte, with the camera, thank you for being here. She has some informational flyers she'd like to share with you about this topic, and we'll be at the resource table in the back. Also, I'd like to bring your attention that on the far right, we're doing live streaming of this event on social media on Facebook. So, Julie, if you raise your hand so everybody can see you. So, if you have friends who couldn't make it, who want to know this, please let them know this is on Facebook Live right now. And so that the questions that they have, if they email something to you or they text you, then you can ask that question for them. If you don't want to be on video, let us know, and we will make sure that you don't get on video. Um, if you get a chance, put your phones on, on vibrate or on silence so that everybody can hear what's going on. So now, to begin today's discussion, let's start by defining what fraud is. So the definition of fraud, an act or course of deception, an intentional concealment, omission, or perversion of the truth. To gain one, gain an unlawful or unfair advantage. Two, induce another to part with some valuable item or surrender a legal right or perversion of the truth, or one to gain an unlawful or unfair advantage, or induce another to part with some a right, inflict injury in some manner. To give you an idea of how prevalent elder fraud is, here are a few disturbing statistics. There are an estimated 5 million cases of elder fraud that occur in the U.S. annually, resulting in $27 billion in losses. Texas alone lost $1.6 billion to elder fraud last year, 9.6% of the elderly people in the state fell victim for an estimated 355,000 incidences. We can help decrease these numbers through education, information such as this morning. So, we're also working, as the judge mentioned, with Judge Veronica Vasquez to create a multidisciplinary elder abuse exploitation task force. The purpose of this task force is to form a strong network and communication system between all agencies involved in identifying investigating and prosecuting elder exploitation. So that is just one step forward that we've done and taken to help protect the most vulnerable in our community and to help bring those alleged perpetrators to justice. On that note, let's start the discussion. So here are the reports that we have received that I want you all to think about and whoever is ready to answer. The reports we're receiving are harassment and bullying. Restricting information such as copies of leases or association meetings. That's been happening to some of our elderly. That report is coming to us that people living in, in let's say, housing where it's multifamily, <coughs> multiple seniors. Uh, number two, a lack of warning about bomb threats or pest infestation in some living 
and some senior living apartments. They're not told uh, that they have an infestation and they're going to you know, have the pesticides come through. <coughs> Number three, fraudulent insurance scams, <coughs> excessive calling, and receipt tampering. So, what can seniors do to protect themselves on these issues? Whoever wants to start, raise your hand. I'll take it. All right, sure. All right. Well, the, the first thing that, that we can all... Okay, I'm done with this. <laughs> the first thing that we can all do is initiate that call to whatever non-emergency number to the, to, the, to the primary agency in your area. If you live in the city of San Antonio, it's going to be San Antonio Police Department, 210-207-7273. If you live in unincorporated Bear County, 210-335-6000. That's your first logical step, okay? Uh, call an officer out, have them dispatch an officer or a deputy out to your house to take that initial report, and then they'll offer guidance. There's, a, there's other law enforcement agencies and government agencies that you can make these claims to, but that's your first logical step is make that police report with whatever first responding agency you have, and it makes it easier on you. Those are the only two numbers that you need to know about. And then we'll get you to the we'll get you to the rest once you make that that first call for the non-emergency. All right, that's good. What can we do uh, to help identify scams when people present themselves as employees of a government agency, but CPS, SAWS, or any other agency, uh, law enforcement? How do we help protect our seniors? How do they identify them? Go ahead. Chief, go ahead. So uh, understand this. Any of the utilities, none of the utilities will ever call you and ask you for money over the phone. They won't do it. Uh, when I did my short little stint at CPS as the security director, they were, we were always getting calls about that. People would call in and they would say, we're going to turn your electricity off, we're going to turn your water off at the end of the day if you don't give us this much money and send it to this address. So never, ever, ever, never, ever take those calls as being um, official. They're not going to ask you for money over the phone. They're not going to threaten you over the phone. They may threaten you with a, with a letter, but they're not going to do it over the phone. So don't fall for that. Don't give any money over the phone. Okay? Or personal identification. Exactly. Uh, you know, all these password schemes, you know, you, you need to confirm your password with us. Otherwise, your account's going to be shut off. All, all those sorts of things. If they're asking you for information, don't give it. Ask them to write a letter to you or ask them, let me talk to your supervisor, that sort of thing. Okay? So, Sheriff, did you want to say something? Yeah, can I, can I just add a quick something? So, you know, that's the thing is, is they capitalize on the fact that uh, many of us come from a simpler time when... Well, if somebody comes to your door and says they work for the census or for CPS Energy, why would anybody pretend to be that? Well, because they know that, that that helps gain them legitimacy in your eyes. And so there's a very important person here in the back of the room that, that I would certainly, on the break or afterwards, uh, go talk to this young lady. She's with the census, uh, Census 2020, and they're out and about. Uh, are you, do you already have people going door to door legit legitimately? Yes. Okay, they've already got people going out legitimately door to door. But we've also been told there's also already scams going on. Uh, and the scammers are out there asking for people, hey, I'm with the census. I need the names of everybody in the residence and their social security numbers. Is that something we would be asking for at the door? Absolutely. No. They're going to ask you for certain demographic information, but they're never going to ask for your social. But in the fog of war, we all got kind of get caught up in it, and it's very easy to give them that information. And then they're off and, and running and, and stealing the identities of everybody. So your simplest thing that you can do if somebody comes to your door, was that, was that the actual question, was that the yes, door? Yes, yes. Is the simplest thing you can always do, whether it's somebody purporting to be a police officer, a deputy, a CPS worker, um, uh, an elect, you know, a, a utility worker, or somebody from the <coughs> census, always, always, always ask for photo ID. Even if they're wearing a very official looking yellow or orange vest, even if they're showing you some sort of a metal badge, They'll flash it real quick that says police or detective or sergeant or whatever on it. Always ask for a photo ID. I carry one. Chief carries one. Every law enforcement officer in the, in the county and city that I know of carries one. The census workers carry one. She'll be able to show you what it looks like. But that's always your most surefire bet is ask to see photo ID. When in doubt, don't give them the information. If you're in doubt as to 100% if this person is, is there, don't give them the information. Um, call in to whatever agency they're purporting to be from and then verify that. 
Don't take the number from them. Don't say, hey, what's the number to your office so I can call and verify? Because they're going to give you a fake number where their Cunhal is going to answer, right? So you need to make sure that you're, you're if, if they say they're from CPS, go look for the number to CPS and then call CPS. Hey, do you have people in my area? There's a guy at my door says his name is, is Bob Smith, and he says he works for you guys. So there's things that you can do proactively. It may come across as, as uh, rude, okay? And again, they're capitalizing on the fact that we come from a, a, from a generation that we don't want to be rude to people. If somebody says they're a, they're a caseworker, I, I don't want to be rude to the guy. I don't want to ask him for ID. I want to take him at his, at, his, at his word. We can't do that anymore. We don't live at that, in that time anymore, unfortunately. And so I always ask for that ID. Thank you. Lieutenant, you had something to add to? No, it, it, and that's exactly the point that I wanted to make uh, was independent, verifi independent verification. And that also works on phone calls as well. Phone fraud's a huge issue these days. So if you just, there's absolutely nothing wrong with hanging up and independently researching a number, calling to verify who you're talking to. And that's exactly what needs to be done is whenever you have an interaction with somebody and you're kind of worried about it, do that independent verification. It's going to save you a lot of problems. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, please go ahead and start with us. I will speak. Use the um, mic so that the recorders can get the voice. With regard to Adult Protective Services, uh, when an Adult Protective Services caseworker comes to your house, they have to ask you permission to enter. You don't have to give them permission to enter. Um, so an APS worker is will be asking you some personal information as part of the, the investigation, but if you doubt that um, it is a legitimate case, just as the sheriff mentioned, they can give you a 1-800 number for you to call back and verify that we are uh, investigating a particular case. We do have some options available with Adult Protective Services for a forcible entry if we need to, but the judge here has to approve that and allow that. And there are certain circumstances by which we would have to do that. But there are emergency situations, high-risk situations where something like that would happen. But if an APS worker is knocking on your door and the people in purple should have an ID hanging on their, on their uh, neck, they should have a picture ID and uh, they should have a business card and they should give you a number by which to call back to verify that we are actively um, <coughs> investigating an APS report. Very good, thank you. That's good information. You know what I want to do at this time? You had a question. You were first, so why don't you go ahead and stand up and ask your question. I would like to say... Someone, let's give her a mic, please. Thank you. No picture, please. I'm cool. Thank you. I am 80 years old, and I live in the private condominium. I vote for... Hold the mic closer to your mouth so we can hear you. I'm 80 years old, and I live in the private condominium. We don't have anybody to help us with the management. They do what they want. We are on their mercy. We put assessment out to cover 44 units. You only cover 40. I'm in the front. In the night, at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, they're knocking on my door. Who's knocking on your door? Who knows? People with the hoodies. Okay. And I'm not covered, but I paid a thirty-seven hundred dollars. Covered by what? What is it you're talking about? Lights or what? What, what no, is sir. the assessment? What was it? The for? assessment was to put the fence yes. around to protect the vehicle, oh, the condo. So you remember that? Yes, yes, yes. Vehicle. But you're in the front, so you don't have any protection. Nothing. He put the fence. Those are the four units, and the fence are back here. Right. The mm -hmm. fence is back. Right. So four units: one, two, and two more. We, we don't have no coverage at all. Right. We don't have no place to go to. Every assessment that we put out, half away, they stop. The money goes somewhere else. Now they want to do the roofs. The building is a D1, D2, D3, and D4. And uh, it looks like he wants $8,000 for each one of us, plus the interest that the frost, if they give it the lending. I'm 80 years old. I don't want to put $8,000 out. I don't want to. So and if I drop a dead, he put a lien on my condo. So let me ask a question to the panel. I, what I'm hearing is 
you feel that the owner of your condo unit is unfairly assessing everyone where you can't afford it, and so that so I, I don't know who on the panel. Can he's help not us. the owner. He's the management. Management. Okay. And we don't have any agency in San Antonio to help us with the private property. Nobody. Okay. And I understand this is a city. <coughs> you can do nothing. <coughs> but where can we go to? Well, let's ask the panel. If, if you protected the seniors. Yeah. We have some of them. A lot of seniors live there. Okay, well, I would first suggest pull that mic close to you, oh. the one in front of you. Yeah. I would suggest talking to an attorney. So yeah, I've done that. I've you, done that. yes. So there's thirty-five hundred dollars up front. And right. So there are legal services that are less than that. Okay. What I would go to. There's two nonprofit organizations that I can name off the top of my head that have attorneys that either do it pro bono, which means for free, or low-cost services, okay? So one of them is going to be Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. The deal with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, though, is that they, um, they have very strict guidelines. So depending on how much you actually, your income monthly, you may not be able to qualify. The other, the, let me finish this. <laughs> She's ready. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you make $1 more than what they are right. to, that's you right. Don't that's you right. Rich. That's right. Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid is, is yeah. that way. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yeah. And then there's the other organization, which is Catholic Charities. Okay. Catholic Charities doesn't have as strict of a guideline. When I was there, uh, it was about, you had to be 200% over the fe uh, federal poverty guideline, which most of Bear County is going to be covered by that. So that's another organization that I would contact. Um, and I don't know if St. Mary's has an actual housing clinic, but you can call the San Antonio Bar Association as well. They do have um, the Community Justice Program that is a nonprofit arm of the San Antonio Bar Association. They also do some work um, for pro bono or at low cost. I've done that. Okay. And, so and, you have to pay. And a ACOG as well. ACOG is another, they have a senior, they have attorneys that they have on retainer that actually help do a lot of legal services that they will pay for specifically for seniors because they get grants. So those I are the organizations. Okay, well, those are the only organizations that I know of. That's what I'm saying. So, I tried all those things. I tried, but nothing works. And then the only other option would be an attorney actually taking it pro bono. But that's why I would go through the San Antonio <coughs> Bar Association to see if they have anyone that would be able to help you. Another thing is, when you win a case and the judges say, you're wrong, you owe her, him or her, that amount, how are you going to get it? You've got to get an, an attorney again. Well, you, yeah, and usually you have to get an attorney to help you with that. That's correct. Why we go to the small claim court and don't tell you up front that after that you need an attorney? Right. I know that. Yeah. But they charge you $300 an hour. I'm up the creek. So I, I understand, but that, that would be my advice is going to an attorney. So and let's let me talk, say something. Let's talk about... This is a little, your case specifically, right afterwards, so we get to all more, more questions, okay? Social Security messes me up. I only get $3 a month. Oh, that's not good. We, we will oh, talk about your case $3 after. A Any month. other questions? Yes, ma'am, right here in the front. How are you doing? Good, good, man. How are you? I recently learned that an elderly couple in my Real close. I recently learned that an elderly couple in my neighborhood has been scammed a few times. One of the incidents was with a contractor that was advertised in our homeowners association newsletter. So I have two questions. Is there a way that the homeowner board can vet the advertisers in our newsletter? And secondly, when it's a he said, she said, when the contractor says he doesn't know anything about what she's saying versus the elderly. And by the way, another reason why elderly people don't report these kind of crimes is they're afraid of retaliation. Mm -hmm. This couple is very afraid that this one person is going to come back and hurt them. Is it a roofing job or what type of um, work? Yard. Yard work. And, and, and so the question is, you're saying the contractor put an ad in their newsletter. Uh, obviously the association didn't vet the person. The person, there, there's a disagreement whether he, was, he or she was paid. And they say, or whatever the issue is, but now they're feeling they're taking advantage of it. Yes. Um, the Homeowner Association, I'm on the board, and so I want to know how can we vet these contractors in the future so this doesn't happen again. That's a good, uh, good question. Are there any types of, uh, I guess in the old days we'd call the Better Business Bureau or stuff like that. I, 
Is there anything, Lieutenant, that, that you are taking complaints on businesses that are in the history of taking advantage of people? And, you know, we've had th these issues will pop up every once in a while, unfortunately. You can do a lot of checking, uh, see if they're licensed to work within the city of San Antonio. Um, I would suggest you check with our uh, construction licensing uh, bureau within the city. Uh, and, and I like your suggestion, Senator, about uh, uh, the Better Business Bureau and, and doing maybe some research online so that you can identify whether these contractors have a, have a history of, uh, of, of issues related to, to the people they're working with. Uh, I'm sorry, it's development services um, is where you can check on a contractor to see whether they're, licensed, whether they're licensed to work within the city. I would also call your, so a couple of things. One, you could ask the, the contractor for letters of reference uh, to, before they're allowed to advertise. I'd ask for letters of reference and then, um, you know, we have to do things where they can, before you put them in there, because by putting them in there, the, the community sees it as an endorsement, exactly. uh, even though it's a paid advertisement. But they still, they, they feel there's some sort of, you're, you're advocating this as a good person. And so I see the difficulty. Now, the other point that you made that I think is very important, how do people file a complaint without feeling that they're going to be potential targets? That's another question. How do, how do seniors know that they can make a complaint against someone who did some work on their house and feel safe? What, do we, what, what advice do we have for them? And, and we're certainly always willing to listen to people come in and, and discuss these issues. Frequently, many of them can be civil, but obviously some of them become criminal, can become criminal at some point. So we, we have a great process of, of bringing citizens in, sitting down, listening to them, trying to identify where their problem is with a specific uh, matter that they're having. Um, that's a very low stress thing for us. It's a low stress thing for the uh, person that's that's coming in to talk to us. So we're, we're always, both us and Property Crimes, we're always willing to sit down with you and have a, have a nice, calm, relaxed discussion about what's going on. Lieutenant, so it, please, please don't be worried about coming in and talking to us. We're going to make you feel good, and, and we're going to do what's appropriate with regard to protecting these people. The first lady who spoke had a very interesting, she, she talked about how every time she goes to see a, a, an attorney, it costs her money, right? right? So the question is that I have is, how can you help the seniors know when it's a criminal versus a civil? What number should they call to know, okay, yes, this rises to the level of criminal, no, this is a civil. How do, they, how, how do we take the onus off them to decide what's the legal avenue? And, and, and really, again, some of these things are very complex matters and it relates to contract law, um, what contract exists. So it's, so it's one of those things where we can discuss these matters over the phone, and we do frequently. Um, and we're always willing to take your calls. Our number is 207-7451. If you ever want to give us 207 7451 We just put it back up there. there. So that's the number that you can call, <coughs> discuss anything that you... I mean, but the typical criminal is like, let's say they gave a roofer a deposit and the guy never came back, and never, or they gave him, paid him half the job and he, he put a few shingles and left him. Right. That's criminal, obviously, right? It's theft of service. Theft by failure to provide the services. Uh, the number's right up there, 207-7451. Uh, anyone else have a question in the audience? If not, I have a Facebook Live. I've got questions coming in. All right, the question that I... All right, go, go ahead. Um, good morning. Um, I just have a comment, and I guess it goes to our chief. Um, about a year ago, a police officer or someone dressed as a police officer came to my door and knocked on the door and I looked out the window and I asked him, yes officer, and he told me that he needed to check my alarm system because it was going off, which was not true. So I said, um, well, he said, can you come down please? I need to make sure that everyone is all right. So of course, this is an, supposedly an officer dressed in full uniform. So I went downstairs and I opened the door wide open and I became very suspicious at first because of the way he stood with his hand against the door and I'm going through CIT training before with, before I used to work someplace else. I knew that probably there wasn't a police officer and just FYI, I immediately said, well, it's probably the kids that are playing upstairs with, with the games and probably send me it off, but let me go upstairs and check on them and make sure that my husband checks on them, which is, I don't have a husband, but you know. 
And he said, okay, uh, so, so there's people out, 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 out upstairs. And I said, yeah, all the kids are upstairs. Let me go make sure that they're not playing with the alarm. So immediately I called the police department and of course it was not true. Uh, and they send an officer right away to, to check it out. But you know, they, I was surprised when I checked with my neighbors that they said that this man, young man, had been knocking on the doors asking if they were all right and if anyone was home for just FYI, sir. We appreciate that. If, if, if you have someone knocking at your, at your door claiming to be an SAPD officer, it will be very apparent. Uh, if they're not in uniform, they will certainly show you their credentials. But if they do come in uniform, they'll be in a marked car, and again, it will be very, very apparent that it's an SAPD officer. But if you have a doubt about it, you can always call police communication. You can always dial a 911 emergency number and let them know that there's a police officer at your door. And if it is an SAPD officer who was dispatched or not, they will still know if that officer was officially sent to your address. Okay? But next time, don't open the door unless you're sure, okay? Nobody open the door. Yes, sir, in the back. My name is Lalo De Leon, and I'm an advocate for uh, disabled veterans. What it is, is uh, the state of Texas uh, counts your disability against all services that are provided to disabled veterans. The United States government don't do it. That's tax-free. Uh, so, uh, now the city is also uh, helping the veterans uh, in the programs that they have. So uh, I wonder if uh, you, Senator Melendez, can help us. Uh, because like the lady says, $1 yeah. over the property level disqualifies you, but yet you have people that uh, have never been in the service, that will work, all that, and they uh, provide a lot of the benefits that the veterans don't do. The VA doesn't doesn't uh, provide uh, some of the veterans as the state does. So uh, please give us your hand. Sure, absolutely. The, basically, it, it's, it's been a problem I've had with the, how the state cap qualifies or calculates these figures and the VA benefits. So afterwards, let's talk to him and see what, when specifically he's talking about which services, okay? So, all right. Uh, I have a question from the audience that says, how long must a truck, car, or van be parked in the street with out-of-date tags before it can be cited or removed? Sounds like a code compliance issue. Uh, anybody? So... What, I guess my suggestion is here, I, if you know your code, number to code compliance, you call them. If you don't, you can call us or, or 311 will give them that. 311 will give you the information number to turn in the car that's parked in the, sometimes on blocks or something that hasn't moved in three weeks or so. It can be, Senator, it can be, it can be cited immediately. Immediately. And then they'll, if it's, uh, appears to be abandoned uh, and, or needs to be off the street, right. put a sticker on it. And I, I'm not sure, I think it's 48, what is it, I mean, 48? I think it's 24, I thought it was 24. 24, 24, 24 hours before that has to be removed, before it's towed. Very good. Very good. We have a question from Facebook Live. Someone said, is there a department asking, is there anybody asking to verify people's identification to vote? They're, they're getting these knocks on their door. I don't know of anybody asking for anybody to verify anybody's ID. Do any of you all know of anybody that has, there's no reason to ask people for their ID to vote? No. 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 So, so, you know, we all know that, unfortunately, in, in Texas, you have to have your, your photo ID to vote. But that's your business. That's your business when you go to vote. You don't need to prove it to anybody. Uh, you just, you, when you go to vote, don't, don't answer the door. Don't, don't respond to a call saying something. Can you verify your identification to vote? Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Do you have, uh, during election time, workers uh, on your campaign that come knocking on the door with a list of names on there yes, and asking you if you're going to vote for this particular candidate, which is a little bit different than what you just said. Sure, sure. They don't ask for ID, but they're asking you and they say, here you are on the list. Uh, you voted many times. Uh, how are you going to vote this time? Well, yes. They, we, most, most candidates for office have hired or have volunteers or themselves. I've blocked walk since 1997, 
and I have the clipboard, and I know who on that street has voted, and I, all I know is if they voted in uh, which primary they voted, and how many elections have they missed, or how many elections have they voted in. And typically when you knock on someone's door, you know, I'll go up and I'll say, hey, how are you? Uh, your last name is Mr. What's your last name, sir? Uh, Palomares. Mr. Palomares, good morning. I'm Jose Menendez. I'm running for state senate. I was wondering, uh, you know, if you notice, we've passed this bill on uh, cyberbullying. We passed this bill on the Holocaust. We've done these other things, and uh, wanted to see if you would might be able to might would you consider voting for me? And that sort of thing. And then it's up to you to say, you know what? That's my business. Uh, thank you very much. No, you know, I don't like you. Or yes, you know, you're great. <laughs> Whatever you want to say, that's up to you. And, and, yeah, yeah. Hey, and, and lately what I've what I noticed is very fewer and fewer people are even answering the door. I've seen people, you knock on the door and they wave at you, bye. But, you know, whatever is okay with you. Yes, but that is the case. Now, most people on their campaigns, we make sure that if they're working for us, that they'll have a t-shirt, you know, that identifies them. Uh, they shouldn't ask you for any personal information. Uh, their job is to know whether or not the, the candidate has support in that community. If the, if, but if you choose to say, I'm undecided, uh, I, I don't prefer to say anything, I, my vote is private, that's your, that, and they, that's okay. They're good. Their job, they should be trained well enough to say, have a great day, thank you very much, and keep going. You know, that's it. But yes, most, if not all, I mean, I think good campaigns are out there talking to people, asking, because sometimes what happens, this has happened many times, well, you know, I, I, I need to talk to him about this or that and the other. Okay. And they get back to me and say, they, Mr. Palomares wants to talk to you about something. And we call or come and visit. And we, we try to, you know, be reactive, responsive to you. Good question. Anybody else have a question? That does happen. You have, is this a question? Those censor people, they come to the door. Pardon me? Censors. Censors, yeah. censors people will be coming. They have photo ID. Yeah, well, I, I didn't open the door, but I opened the balcony door. Okay. And he said, can you come down? I said, for what? He says, the censors. Well, as long as they have a photo ID. But you know what? what? The lady in the back, let's talk to her at the break. We're going to have a break in about five minutes. This lady in the back is next. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I am here, to, since this is an assembly of a good number of seniors, I'm going to say something that's related to the topic that you're discussing today, but which is Social Security. And I just want to ask the seniors to please belong to a senior organization. One like the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, and the other one is the Alliance for Return Americans. It is very important because seniors are going to have to be the ones to make sure that the grandchildren, the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren and the great-great-grandchildren have benefits, and that's Social Security, a lifetime benefit. We have to do it because we are the biggest population in the United States. And when seniors support no privatization, and we tell uh, congressmen and senators that if you don't want to take care of us, and if you don't want to take care of these generations that are coming with benefits for them to have everything that they need when they get old. That's those that are born today and those that are already here. They have a future. And they're being told Social Security is not going to be here for you. And I'm telling the young ones, you just say I beg your pardon. You're the one that's not going to be here. Because we are going to get together, we're going to put you out, and we're going to find people who want to take care of us when we get old. That should cover Thank you. That. Thank you very much. I couldn't agree with you more. That's very good. Uh, we need to take care of Social Security for, for uh, everyone. We have a question here that came in writing, and the question has to do with the Attorney General. This would be a good one for our judges, or our judge and, and DA's office. It says here, uh, what, what do you do when a, the Attorney General oversteps a judge's order, like in the case of child support? Is that enough information? Is there a way they can complain about it? Or is the person who wrote this, can you explain further what you meant by the overstepping of the judge's order? If you don't want to do it now, we can do it privately at the break. So, uh, 
I, I have heard, and this I'll give the, the judges, I have heard recently I had a case in my office where there was a child support case and the, the, the gentleman never got to see the child and the judge stamped and did the order and said, well, you only make X amount and you're only going to owe it till the child's 18. And then the AG's office came in uh, with some new computer system and said, no, now you owe all of this back child support and then put liens and it's costing him his, his new marriage and he's having all sorts of problems. He's a senior citizen now, the child's an adult and, and he, he doesn't seem to have any type of, uh, any, anywhere to get some relief. It seems like the Attorney General's office is very uh, adamant about trying to collect on something that really wasn't, it wasn't what the judge ordered. And so maybe this is what this is a real life. Any advice? I, I don't work with child support. However, I do have enough family members that have had to deal with child support. Um, and unfortunately, we see that a lot. It, even with, there was one case in a, with a, one of my family members who had been paying child support. And at some point in time, they had changed it to where it had to go straight through the Attorney General's office. He didn't know that that was a change, but he kept sending checks and kept sending checks. Well, daughter turns 18, and then he finds out, well, all these, he's been paying his child support faithfully for 18 years, and then it turns out the past 10 years that Attorney General's office didn't count it because it wasn't going through them. And there was no recourse that he could actually seek. He got an attorney, and the attorney negotiated with, um, with mother, even though mother had knew that he had paid his back child support, there's a waiver that they can basically sign. There's a, a, something that they can sign saying that, yes, he indeed paid child support the past 18 years, but she was not wanting to do that. And so he then had to make a deal. <laughs> he had to make a deal. And at that point, um, it was the, it, the AGs kind of went away because they made their own side deal. So I don't know what the recourse is, but I do know that it happens a lot and even yeah. they can put liens on your property they can garnish your wages they can do a lot of things to get that money and I have seen where again the person has turned 18 right. and all of a sudden the AG goes after them so I I don't deal with this area of the law so I don't know what the recourses are but I do know that it happens you know what we need to do at the break is get a list of all the legal services that were available mm -hmm. in Bear mm -hmm. County yes. so that when people have legal issues and they you know it may be in a position where they can't afford right. an attorney where they can go. Uh, this will be the last question before the break. Then we're going to take a quick bathroom break. And um, this question is interesting. It has to do with a hospital. The question is, why don't hospitals check to make sure uh, that the identification matches with the patient who's come in? This person was a victim of, it seems like it was an identity theft, uh, when someone used their identity and the patient had the same name, and the hospital didn't check uh, that to ensure that the patient was actually the person who was using the benefits. The doctor's office made a mistake, and it's true what he, he or she writes here. Every one of us gives our personal information, including our social security, to our doctor's offices, and then someone made a mistake of writing the wrong information. And, you know, what <coughs> advice do you have to make sure that they're not losing this when they're handing out this critical information uh, so that someone doesn't, you know, steal their identity. Is there anything we can do to protect ourselves when we're forced to share our private? Because every one of you all said, don't share your private, your social security, don't share this. Well, but when you go to the doctor, they ask you for all those things. So what can we do to protect ourselves? This is an excellent question. So... We deal with identity theft issues quite a bit in our unit. Some of them end up being those medical related sort of things. We've actually had detectives waiting in doctor's offices for people to show up for appointments to, to put handcuffs on them. So we, we deal with them. Unfortunately, it happens. You're a little bit at the mercy of some of these doctor's offices and really a lot of the people that you interact with. Once you hand over that identifying information, you're really kind of dependent on some of these business to protect that. Sometimes they don't do a great job of it. Uh, what was the big uh, credit agency leak that we had? Experian was it? Equifax. Equifax. Equifax breach. I was a victim of that. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us showed up on that. But anyway, we're dependent on these businesses. If you get an identity theft issue, whether it's a doctor's office or something like that, call, make a police report. 
we work on those things all the time. Do your best to, to maintain custody of that information. Try not to carry a lot of things in your wallet. I get on my mom about this. Is that the same number you said earlier? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, re let's repeat that number. 207? 207-7451. 5 one. Right. All right. And, and limit what you carry on your person on a daily basis. What do you really need? You need maybe a driver's license, a little bit of cash, insurance card, maybe a credit card. My mom carries a wallet full of things that she shouldn't be carrying all the time. Yeah. Minimize your risk as you're moving around and, and what you what you can be willing to lose. Don't ever leave anything in your vehicle because as soon as somebody breaks into your vehicle, they've got it and they're off buying stuff at Best Buy or wherever. <laughs> But uh, do those things. Give us a call. Make a police report. If you need help on, a, on an identity theft issue, and we, we will work with you on that. Thank you, Lieutenant. Ms. Cortez, you have something to add to that? Yes, I'd just like to add that for, uh, for those of you who have insurance, have Medicare or Medicaid, those are managed through uh, what is called CMS. And you should be getting either monthly or quarterly a statement that indicates what services they've, they've paid or reimbursed. So that's another indicator to review that stuff that comes in um, in the mail and ensure that you did, in fact, receive those services. If you are noticing that you're being, or your insurance or CMS is uh, paying for services that you did not receive, that is a sign that somebody may be using your um, information for medical services. I'll tell you that it's very difficult from an adult protective services standpoint, to tease out when identity theft has occurred. We've had instances where um, we're looking for an individual and, and we think that they are, you know, Ann Cortez and, they, and they're using Ann Cortez's identity um, and um, it's, not, it's not the same individual. When you have very similar names, um, you know, Juan Garzas or, or, you know, Paul Smith. Um, that is also an, an indi you know, an easy way of, of uh, mistaken identity. So please review that information that comes to you in the mail and ensure that the services that you are being charged for are actually are the services that you receive. So, Ms. Cortez, one way to do this, and this is for, our, for all of us, not just seniors, but anybody, um, keep track on your calendar, wherever you keep your calendar, your phone or on a big calendar. And if you need a calendar, we will give you a calendar. But keep track of your doctor's visits. You know, uh, you put the date, October 9th, I went to see the doctor and then uh, at this time and they had lab work or whatever. You just put it down so that if you get something in the, look at that bill and you say, look at the service date. If that service date doesn't match with yours, then you go, hey, that's not me. And then you can call it in and say, look, here's my track. I keep track of all my visits, and I know what's going on. At this time, we're going to take a five-minute break. <laughs> to look for this brochure when you, before you leave. Don't leave without this. And I'll tell you, on the very front, it says victim services. But this is more than just victim services. It's a directory of organizations and agencies that provide help. So, in the back, Emily's holding them up. See, they're right there. And Emily, you know what would be great? Do we have enough for everybody? Do we, have, do we know? Fifty. We don't have enough for everybody. So, but on these, we'll get you all more. You know what? We'll get some to our office and we'll get everybody. So, the very first at the top, it says legal services. You have a list of legal services. Bear County Dispute Resolution, Family Justice Center, Catholic Charities, Center for Legal and Social Services, Community Law Center, Bar, Lawyers, Referral, St. Mary's, and Rio Grande Legal Aid. Then you have financial services, government agencies. I mean, this is a really a great list. Law enforcement, a list of numbers, and children's services, counseling services, and domestic violence services. This is really great. Um, would you tell the, the DA thank you for putting together this for us? We'll make sure that everybody gets a copy. Names and numbers. If you need, uh, it's if you need us to help you translate it, come by our office and we'll help you. But that's but it's pretty straightforward. It's phone numbers. It's the names of the agencies. The sheriff, the sheriff's office has dropped off this right here, and the sheriff's office has this list of benefits that they do. Apparently, they're hiring and a citizen engagement 
uh, guide with emails and where you can find the, city, the sheriff's offices throughout the county. Sheriff, thank you. Did you bring, how many copies do we have of these? Uh, I think we should have enough. Okay, so then we can, we can hand these out if we need to. Okay. On Facebook? Okay, great. So our office, what we're going to do is take a picture of the DA's, the directory of the organizations and the agencies, and you'll see it on our Facebook page. All of them, make sure you can see the names and the numbers if you don't get a copy of them. All right. So now that you know, in addition to having uh, our Senate team, in addition to having the, the SAPD, the sheriff himself, the DA's office, the Judge uh, Vasquez, we also have State Rep. Bernard's office, Councilman Trevino, and Congressman Castro. Does anybody have a question for our panel that you'd like to... You know what I'd like to hear? Uh, I'm going to ask, um, not to put you on the spot, but this, since there's so many purple shirts, what are... What are the, the frauds or the abuse that you see some seniors that are seeing coming up that maybe no one here has been exposed to, but you want us, they need to be aware of, they need to be <coughs> careful, this is happening, and sorry. Has anybody seen, do you want to handle that in? Is there something out there in the field that has been reported more than you all, that, that you see as possibly a trend? Is there anybody seeing anything like that? How are you? I am. Well, and since I'm not in the field, I'm going to defer this question to my staff who is in the field. Um, if, if there are, uh, Lisa, uh, Centeno, uh, she is our community initiatives uh, uh, specialist, and she is currently working with various uh, community organizations uh, addressing the issues of, uh, of financial ab abuse and fraud. Um, she is our liaison to a board, uh, a No Protective Services board that we've established, and also the Silver Sabbath uh, Committee. And so, is there, uh, Lisa, any information that you have with respect to? Uh, potential fraud or, or things that our staff have been encountering out in the field. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we often see in what's challenging is that APS does not handle the fraud per se because we, in order for our agency to get involved, there has to be an ongoing relationship. However, where we work collaboratively with the other organizations, and partner is that when we have an older adult who doesn't have the capacity or doesn't understand their situation, then that's when APS can intervene because we would become involved when it's, and we would look at that for neglect. And so it's very important, and I know it's not always easy to call Adult Protective Services or pick up the phone and call non-emergency to ask police to go out. But it is important to call us because when we go out, we'll look at the, the individual's entire situation. And often in Adult Protective Services, what we often see is that when there's a, one form of neglect or abuse that's occurring, we often see that there's other uh, forms of abuse that are co-occurring at the same time. And so that's why it's urgent to give us a call. You just said something that's, I think, important for us to think about. There's two separate things. Neglect and abuse can be the same, but can be separate too, right? Yes. Uh, Tell us that what neglect could be examples of neglect. Um, types of neglect that we often see uh, might be self-neglect, or it could fall under the caretaker neglect. So that means what? Not eating? Uh, not eating, not t uh, taking care of yourself. Um, somebody who might be living in a home that's that's not being uh, kept up, a person who might have difficulty. Kept up would be not bathing? Yes, not bathing, clothes. Um, not taking their medication properly, um, you know, not able to prepare their own fee uh, meals, not able to bathe themselves. It's those challenges uh, that they have difficulty with. And I know that you're in this field every single day, and that's why sometimes you just you, you we categorize into words. But many of us out in the out of the world, we don't realize that you know when someone's not there to help you out if you need some. That's a little bit of neglect. That's abuse. That can be abuse. And sometimes I think seniors don't want to understand that maybe they're neglecting themselves. They won't get in trouble if they call you, but you can help them provide services, right? 
Yes, uh, we, we can help provide uh, protective services, but uh, a lot of that will depend on the individual's willingness to accept our help. And that is, I think, some of the biggest challenges that these individuals who all are wearing purple shirts today <coughs> encounter. There are times when we can make a difference in a person's life, but if that person has capacity and they do not want to accept our help, then we may need to walk away from the situation and not be able to assist the individual. What kind of help can you offer? Um, the, the services that we offer are wide-ranging. Um, we can provide assistance with uh, temporary relocation in case they're in an abusive situation and need to leave. Um, there are times if somebody's been financially exploited and they need assistance with um, medications or they need assistance to pay utility bills because they, they don't have that money, um, we can assist with that. There's times that sometimes they, they are without food or and they need that, that emergency assistance. So what, what number would they call? The number they would call is 1-800-252-5400. I, I, I want to make a comment on that. So, I, so hold on a second. I'm, I, I, I just let me let me let her finish, and then we can because we're going to have a Q and A. Uh, the reason I, I think it's important because sometimes when we're in an okay situation, we don't understand what's happening out, out there. That that maybe we have a friend who we just think of it as well. It's too bad. It's so sad that maybe their kids don't take care of them. They don't check on them. They don't this but maybe they're in a situation that's maybe a little worse and, and there's services that could help. Is that what you're saying? Yes, there are a variety of services, uh, just like the numbers that, uh, that the DA's office had, but there's also a wide variety of services, uh, which I kind of refer to as our aging network here in, in Bear County and throughout the state of Texas. But there's the, the city of San Antonio, the Department of Human Services offers a wide ranging services there are private companies uh, that provide, uh, you know, geriatric care management to assist individuals. And then we also have our, our other sister agencies through the Health and Human Services Commission uh, that offer services through the long-term service supports through them. And then the federal agencies, nonprofits, our faith-based organizations. So it's it's a wide network of services that are here to support our older adults. So by calling that number, though, that's not a number just to say, hey, hey, my neighbor's getting beat up by their someone. It's it's just that's a number that says you can report anything and you can ask for help. That number is to specifically to our hotline for adult protective services, and that's specifically for. Um, if somebody suspects that somebody could be in a state of abuse, neglect, or financially exploited, they can call that number. The neglect could be also not having food in the pantry or the fridge, right? Correct. Okay. Because sometimes I think we sometimes don't want to bother anybody or we don't think it's a crime. And, and you know, we just think, well, I just don't have enough to buy groceries and therefore you don't eat. And I, and I or. I've seen people make a decision and say, well, today I take that medicine that's $10 or I, I buy bread. And, I, and what you're telling me is they don't have to be making those decisions, right? Right. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. The other thing I'd just like to mention is that if somebody is not in a state of ne abuse, neglect, or financially exploited, uh, the Alamo Service Connection has a hotline where they have a lot of services and it's a dedicated uh, number that individuals can call if they, they're needing assistance. And the Alamo Service Connection number is, um, it's 866-231-5500. Eight, eight, six, six, uh, the Alamo Service Connection and it's through uh, the Area Agency on Aging and it's also uh, and that they can uh, provide uh, services to older adults and get them linked up and, and assist them in other situations where individuals may need some assistance. Thank you so much. Uh, just so that everybody knows, not only is this being 
put on Facebook Live right now. We're taping it so that it can be rebroadcast. So it will be out there. So if you want to say, hey, what did that lady say? What was that number? What, what, what were the things I could call about? You'll be able to watch this later. Uh, what, when do you think Charlotte will be up? Um, in less than a week. In less than days. a week. We'll have it up in less than a week. All right. Uh, I briefly, the San Antonio Food Bank, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our food bank, it's one of the largest in the, um, in the nation. 30, serves 32 counties, and uh, it's located right down the street on 151. And they do a tremendous job helping communities and helping organizations. And today the food bank's represented here by Mario Bledo, who just walked in. They donated uh, the fruit and they donated the food. Water. And sometimes what they can do for you, and they've done it for neighborhoods, if you organize and you can tell them how many families will come by, they can donate a, like a food drive in your neighborhood. Many of these happen at schools, and so if you know a community that needs some extra food, uh, come see Mario afterwards. He, he does a great job. He works for the food bank. We're very proud of our food bank. It's one of the, they've, been, they've received an award as best food bank in the nation, have you not? Yes, ma'am, go right ahead. Uh, on uh, the uh, adult uh, protective service, yes, they are very, very good. I'm going to tell a story that happened to my husband about eight years ago. Uh, this happened in Carrizo, Ashington. I was in California. I had gone to stay over there a few months, but he stayed behind. Well, uh, this store uh, had just opened. They were celebrating the grand opening, and he bought a scratch ticket. I think for five dollars or ten dollars. Well, he won fifty thousand oh dollars. So uh, you know, even family can get uh, can you know, abuse you financially. Oh yeah. Uh, he went to. Uh, he called me and I told him, well, I'm I'm over here. So uh, uh, he has a, a niece that works in the courthouse with lawyers and everything. So I said, well, take it to Letty. Letty will help you. Well. He took the ticket to his, uh, uh, his niece, and she said, well, let's wait a few weeks. I'll keep the ticket. Well, a few weeks later, uh, they went to get him, and he said, okay, we're ready to date so we can go cast the ticket. So they brought him uh, to San Antonio, and, uh, and they collected the money. But then they wanted to cast the, the check. And no bank would take it because they wanted to cash it. They, they, they wanted uh, it to be deposited, and they didn't. Well, she took it, and he said, told him, well, I'll talk to you a few days uh, later. Well, she never uh, came back, and he kept going to the courthouse and talking to her and everything, and she would say, wait, wait, wait. Well, anyway, um, when I came home, I called uh, the Adult Protective Service, and it got involved. Well, um, she kept stalling and stalling and stalling on the money. Finally, she said she was ready to give him the money. The only amount uh, she returned to him was 14000 because supposedly he had spent a lot of money on renovating and, what, and it was not true. So, you know, there's uh, even children, sons, daughters, relatives can get uh, involved and they will take advantage of uh, the elderly. Oh, sorry to hear that, but I'm glad you got, he got something back. So there was a question here I want to address. Was Sadil, while you're here, and, and I want to give some advice to this person as well. Uh, this person wrote, The city fixed my sidewalks, but they left holes on my driveway. I can't walk there or get my car. Uh, and it says here that it's 7-Eleven Delaware. And then the recommendations we have, if you have a neighborhood association, always go to your neighborhood association meetings. If you haven't called 311, call 311 to get a case number. If you have not called your council district office, give them a call and let them know and give them the case number. So, Dale, anything you want to add to that? To that, Anything that the councilman would do in this case? We, we would be happy to help anybody, and we work really closely with all the council offices, and we let them know when cases like this come up. Senator, I think that was actually perfect. So again, I'm Sidel Brooks. I'm with Councilman Trevino's office. Uh, Councilman Trevino has basically uh, spearheaded the sidewalk repair program, and that's something that we actually have a sidewalk squad now that actively goes in 
and works on those issues. So if you do have an issue with your, your sidewalk or anything like that, um, just like the city said, go ahead and uh, report that into uh, 311, get a case number. And then if you call us with that case number, if they're not following up or anything, um, we can, you know, we have contacts with the supervisors and whatnot, so we'll reach out to them and, and get you an answer about where it is, um, you know, when it's scheduled for, that type of thing. So, thank you. Very good, very good. Any questions? Uh, yes, we, I see two There's questions. Two. Right, this gentleman yes. has not asked any questions. Good morning, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, as a constituent and a registered voter, of course, thank Mr. you very much for this session. Very, very informative. Hopefully you have another follow-up session on this. Sure. Uh, but anyway, I don't mean to be paranoid, but I am in this time of technology because I get so many phone calls, emails, phone calls, and I would ask the panel, what can I do to protect myself? You know how many times they threaten me that IRS is going to pick me up? Yes. And how many times <laughs> they're going to pick me up? And I didn't respond to this jury summons. They're on the way to pick me up and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know else what else. I don't know what else to do. I block my numbers. I have life lock. And so I don't know what else to do. It's, it, it, in essence, it's kind of like not uh, if I will be a victim, but when will I be a victim of identity theft? Right. So thank, so, you. thank you, Mr. Garcia. I, I, I personally want to tell you what I do. I, so, so those of us who are lucky enough to have one of these ridiculous things, um, we, we get calls from places we've never been. I mean, sometimes I'll look down and it'll say somewhere overseas or it says some state and some place, and I look at it and go, I don't know anybody there. So, so, so just, if you don't recognize the number, don't answer. My poor mom, she's 83, she answers every call. And then she gets upset. I'm just like Mr. Garcia said, they're, they're telling me this, they're telling me that. Hang up. Hang up. If you don't recognize the number, don't answer. Okay? Um, it's unfortunate, but that's happening. Uh, any other advice? That's it. Don't, don't answer the phone. <clears throat> delete the email. Delete the text. Whatever it is. Again, they capitalize on the fact that we don't want to be rude. Uh, well, I, they're calling, so I have to answer. That's that's what I get with my folks as well. Um, and if it's any consolation, I've got warrants for my arrest for missing jury duty as well. Uh, I guess I'm not real ones. He's kidding. I guess I'm gonna I'm like, I guess I'm gonna arrest myself to hear these. So so that's always a fun conversation when I get a scam call telling me I got a warrant for my arrest for sure. Uh, but yeah, just you got it. Sometimes you gotta go uh, with your gut and just ignore those phone calls, even though it may seem rude to you. It's, it's what you need to do. You, a little paranoia is a good thing. In the back, there's a lady who's had her hand up for quite some time. I have one of those ridiculous phone calls. Yes, ma'am. And I want to tell, especially like now that every, there's a lot of people here, I... We're going to get you the mic. Hold on just a second. It's coming right there. I have always, um, I have always thought of myself as a very informed senior. You are. Uh, I was till yesterday. <laughs> I got a, a not not a, a phone call. I can do with a phone call, but on my cell, yeah. I got a uh, text, a message, right. not a text, a message. So I clicked on, and I saw Wells Fargo. It's my bank. Oh. Okay, so I clicked on, and then it informed me that my um, debit card had been compromised. Oh, yes. oh, and that I needed, to, uh, that they needed some information because it had been, you know, frozen. Yeah, right. So I said, oh, okay. So I clicked on again, asked for my name, my password. Well, I put my name. I wasn't thinking. I didn't put my password. I put my PIN. I clicked again. And then it came up. Mother's maiden name, blah, 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 blah. All at, at the very bottom, social security. I have been a, uh, a bank, I mean, my account has been 47 years. Wow. And I said, wait a minute, my bank knows all this stuff. So I turned it off. And I went to the bank. It was not my bank. It was not my bank. Right, of course not. So the thing is that what I want to tell everybody, even if you get a message, yep. don't still, the they call it phishing. Yes. <laughs> we have a lady here who works for Jefferson Bank. Uh, Linda, would you like to say anything about that? Yeah. So, so, you know, she's the president of her neighborhood association, New Terry's, but she's also here to get information to help because I love yeah, her bank. She's got a lady at her bank who helps with my mother-in-law. She's a great lady, and I just love the time and the that they take with them. Go right ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, so in the banking world, we see a lot of scams that are focused on the elderly and sometimes even the young. We have romance scams. We, you know, just an example, an individual thought he was in love for seven months and never met the person. Texted back and forth, found out he was being defrauded. So had already turned over about $3,500 in gift cards to this individual, things of that sort. We see it in young, we see it in older. Email scams. If you get an email from someone telling you that you need to contact them, or you need to provide information, or you have a job opportunity that you've not looked, you have not sought out yourself, do not respond to that. We've had individuals who have received phone calls going on with that. <clears throat> if you receive a phone call telling you that a family member has been in an accident and that you need to provide, provide money immediately, call your family member. Do not send anything. If anyone asks you for gift cards, in order for you to receive a service or an opportunity, do not do that. Because in all instances, like very likely, it is fraud. So we just ask that you're diligent, that you're, you're focused on <clears throat> knowing what it is that you're, you're looking for something. If you have not asked for somebody to help you with money, with anything of that sort, then do not respond to that. Because we see so many cases in our fraud division that our customers are taken advantage of. Um, individuals have gone out and don done work on their home. Thousands of dollars later, the job's still not done. But they said, well, I hired them, and everything's fine. But when you really kind of look at that, look, look to somebody that you really trust. And say, you know, I feel a little uneasy about this. Is this really something that I should be doing, responding to, or whatnot? So <clears throat> there are just so many, so many scams out there. I mean, we work very closely with law enforcement, and other fraud groups and other banks within the city that we kind of talk to one another, share information, find out what's going on, but we absolutely recommend do not respond to anything that you have not initiated yourself. Loans, texts, emails, job opportunities, quick money. If somebody's going to give you something, do not buy them gift cards before they give you what they promised you because we see that a lot, a lot. Yes, ma'am. Actually, let me, because there's, there's another question over here. <coughs> Yellow, red. Linda. Oh, I thought, okay, after you, after you. This is not a question. Uh, I'm just going to inform you of what's happening to me. When I get back home today, after being out, I'm going to have messages. I have won I, I, all, all kinds of prizes every day. I. I have one contest here and there and everywhere that I didn't enter. Right. And in the mail, I get uh, um, the, the checks that I, I showed one of the to the bank, and they said that they're good. You can you can deposit them. And uh, what they do is you take this check to the bank, deposit it, and then they they want you to send them some money out of that great amount they gave you, and um, um, you send the money, but the check is not gonna, it's gonna bounce. Right. Yeah, that's not right. So here's one thing, folks. Do y'all remember when we were growing up and our parents, they said to us, and the gentleman, Linda had hers right here, yellow, and then Lauda, um, that they told us if it's too good to be true, it usually is. Remember that one? And in Spanish, it's just, está muy ojona pa paloma, you know? You know and so, so, you know, it's the same thing. I mean, come on, we, we just say, if it's too good to be true, don't, yes, yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Linda. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I work for Wellman, and I'm the economic security caseworker at three of the senior centers. I do the Doris Griffin, the Lopez, and the um, uh, Alicia. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the Cisneros. Anyway, um, I have I because they trust me. They bring all kinds of stories to me, but there's one, um, and I'll see her again on Friday. But uh, this was the first time I heard this, but. Um, this lady went online because she wanted to borrow money to help her son who um, had surgery and so she wanted to borrow $2,500. The, the company looked perfectly legit um, to her so she applied for the loan. <clears throat> the loan officer or the frauder told her that her credit score was very low and so they, they couldn't loan her money right then but that if she sends them 
uh, this certain amount of money. So she sent like 400 and some odd dollars and then um, over uh, a period of time, she sent more than the $2,500 that she was trying to borrow. And in the interim, her car got repossessed. So she was so embarrassed, um, it took her a while, and she does trust me, it took her a while to come to me. So she came to me a few weeks ago, and um, I always pass my cases by um, Ray when I hear these um, um, odd situations. He, um, he works very closely with us, and <clears throat> you know we both determined this was definitely a criminal act. And so um, she said she was very embarrassed. Well, this started last October 2018. And it took her that long to come out and to tell somebody that um, this was happening to her. So when she got to me, I um, immediately called Ray and we determined that it was definitely um, a fraud. So <clears throat> we sent her to the police department. I said, go to the police department and file um, a, a case of a claim against them um, so at least you can have that on record that you know, they are uh, frauding you. Well, in the interim, this guy that was supposed to be this loan officer, he's blowing her phone up. I answered her phone twice. Um, the police officer uh, took a picture of his card and the case number and texted to him. And so that stopped the phone calls. I don't know what's going on now. Um, but my question to um, probably you, um, um, Chief McManus, is that um, once she files, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong person. Well, uh, my question to you, sir, is um, once she files that police report, then what? So those, those are difficult. I think a lot of, a lot of us understand that, that much of that fraud is, is coming in from outside the country, uh, and they're moving money around very quickly and then trying to offshore it. So... Uh, obviously, we want, we want to know about that. We want you to file that report. Uh, we're going to do what we can do uh, to, see, to see what we can do about retrieving that money. I will tell you something, a couple of things. We're working with Secret Service uh, quite a bit recently in, in the last two years to do seizures related to losses like you're talking about. And, and a lot of these are, are losses in the 10, 20, 40, 100, 100 grand uh, range. Um, we're, we're working jointly on these seizures. Our, our uh, seizures for this year relating to fraud, kind of similar to that, is probably six or seven million already for the year. So you really, I mean, as, as the senator was saying, and a lot of people are saying, don't answer that phone call. Don't, you know, don't don't cash that check, uh, and and then send off that money to somebody else. Well, I think most of us realize that those are scams. The second comment I want to make is. I'm caring for my mom, uh, an 86-year-old woman. She's very sharp. She's technologically sharp. But I tell you what, I train her every day about all these scams. So as, as she's hearing them, as the IRS is calling her to come in and uh, she's going to get arrested and all that, um, she's, rec she's realizing what's going on. She's just hanging up on them. Also, you can put your cell phone on do not disturb mode. That will block a lot of the calls from people that are not in your um, contacts list. So do what you can, and if you're caring for somebody that's getting older, uh, like I am, train them. Get in there, uh, make sure they have their wills, power of attorneys, all those things going on, and as they get older and they need help, step in and monitor. Monitor these people, and that way if there's a problem, you can catch it early, stop the problem, stop the bleeding, and, and maintain that financial security for them. You've got to start caring for them before there's a problem. All right. Thank you, Lieutenant. You're getting okay. We have a comment uh, because she's about to leave. So. My name is Inez Benavides, and I'm 88 years old. And I want to thank Senator Menendez for all that he's done. These meetings that he's had all these different months has been intellectual for me, and I've learned a lot. And today was more than one of the very interesting meetings. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just related, and you just reminded me of a story. Actually, I worked with Peaches at Doris Griffin because what we were seeing was 
she contacted me when I was working at Catholic Charities because senior citizens, there were people that were waiting outside of the lobby and they were getting, the non-attorneys, getting people to, they were drafting their wills, they were drafting their powers of attorneys. Now, people sometimes, and we see this a lot, especially in the probate court, people get online information, they pull off powers of attorneys online, or you get someone that's not an attorney that actually does that for you, chances are they're going to do it wrong, okay? Or the forms are not going to be the same forms that are actually accepted now. There's more recent information. With these individuals, they were actually drafting wills, which was the unauthorized practice of law. So at that point, I reached out to the unauthorized practice of law, the bar, the bar and they were investigating these individuals. So definitely do not get legal services from a non-attorney. Because we do see that because they give them a deal. They only do it for, you know, 50 bucks, but then they do it wrong. If you do a power of attorney wrong, guess what? It's not valid. So at the end of the day, what winds up happening is your loved one has to get a guardianship over you, which will cost them thousands of dollars to do when you try to save 50 bucks, okay? So again, you want to make sure that if you get legal documents, that you actually go to a lawyer to receive them because they're going to have the most up-to-date information. And uh, you just you, you, you can also look up that lawyer on the State Bar website to make sure that they're active. You don't want an inactive lawyer. But if you have any questions, you can always contact my office. But again, do not please do not go to a non-attorney to help draft legal documents. So, the very excellent advice, Judge. If you didn't get this, that has all the legal resources, we make copies. Does anybody need a copy of all the numbers that are here? Raise your hand. We will get one to you. So, at every hand that's raised, it's coming to you right now. Um, in our September newsletter that we send by email, we posted tips on how you can get yourself on a no-call list so you don't receive illegal or unwanted robocalls. So we're reposting these tips on Facebook and Twitter, and you can just click on the link and it'll give you the tips on how to get on the no-call list. Uh, we've only got about a little less than 10 minutes left. Um, I want to make sure, Sheriff, did you have something? I, I do. I've got something to add. Um, so look, we do a human trafficking uh, class for, for parents and teens. And we give them a bit of advice that also fits here. I think it's very appropriate for this for this crowd as well. Um, we give the kids an analogy. I always call the kids up and have them ex have have one of them describe to me the devil. What's the devil look like? Oh, he's red. He's got horns. Uh, usually wears a black suit, and one of his feet is it's either a hoof or a chicken foot, right? Um, but here's the thing, and we explain to the kiddos that look, the devil when the devil appears in your life, uh, the devil's not going to show up red with horns and black suit and a chicken foot. The devil's going to show up looking like everything you ever wanted in life. That's what human traffickers do also. But guess what? That's also what scammers do. And so they're going to show up at, at, at just the right time and be exactly what you need. You had a storm last week and you, you got roof repairs. Guess what? They're going to show up and be a roof repairman. Uh, you, you, uh, you know, post that you, you post somewhere online, this is what I'm getting to, uh, that you're lonely because your spouse died several years back and you're visiting their gravesite. Uh, that's where the lonely heart scams will come in. And all of a sudden you'll get um, information from people that uh, have uh, Russian, young, single Russian people that are looking for a spouse. They just want to come over and be taken care of. Um, they're opportunists. And so be careful what you're sharing online as well. Because uh, like, like what Marcus said, his mom's very, very uh, astute when it comes to, it comes to technology. Uh, and, and you know, look, I, I'm, I'm terrified that my dad one of these days is going to discover social media. Knock on wood, he hasn't discovered it yet. But when he does, I guarantee you he's going to share way too much online. And that's when you open yourself. So be careful what you're sharing with people. If you're sharing with people that, oh, finally this vacation that I saved up my entire life for... And now I'm going to be gone to Europe for a month on a carnival cruise line or whatever it is. Guess what you're leaving yourself wide open for. So be careful what you're sharing online as well. So I want to make sure. I, I'm going to take your question. Uh, this came up. For those of us who are caretakers, or and some of you who maybe are currently a caretaker, but we all, hopefully we all have someone take care of us in the future, right? Hope. Oh. Right? I don't know, we hope. The point is this. While you can keep your things organized, what accounts, what you have everything while you're in a good place, and that person that you would, if you needed a power attorney who you would make, the person you trust the most, you need to let them know because if something were to happen and you can't let them know, 
then how do they help you? What resources you may or may not have? So you need to you need to keep your affairs in order when you when you don't need to have them in order. Do you know what I'm saying? Keep and that's what a good thing with these legal resources and the financial services. All right, Laura, you had your hand up the most, and then the gentleman in the Longhorn hat. So go ahead, Laura. Go. You had you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someone's coming. Oh, you handed it off already. Okay. Because I saw Laura's hand up. Well, because he had met, he's already asked a question. He hadn't had a chance yet. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, uh, I have a couple of websites to share with y'all. We'll let Joseph type them there. Uh, the first one is oats.org, and the second one is seniorplanet.org. And uh, Senior Planet is based out of New York City, but their second biggest group in the nation is right here in San Antonio. And folks, this is a uh, free way for you to learn anything from basic computer skills to more advanced skills. And it so happens that the main office here in San Antonio is about 200 feet away from the senator's office there where coverage took care of us. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I just completed one of the courses myself and I uh, recommend them. They're usually two days a week for about five weeks. So, Senior Planet in or Some of them, they'll provide the uh, Chromebooks to get you started on uh, email and contacts and basic computer skills. Others, you'll need to bring your own uh, computer form. Uh, also, want to make a couple other uh, comments. Years ago, I was at a post office where I had maintained a box, but at this point, I was just simply rifling through the trash looking for computer magazines. And uh, this lady came in, she was a little bit distraught, and started confiding in me that she'd been, uh, she was being victimized by one of these Nigerian <coughs> print schemes, and they were trying to get her to send money. And I, I told her very straightforward, I said, this is a, a scam. I said, just look me in the eye and realize I've never met you before, but I'm telling you the honest to goodness truth. And I hope she followed my advice. Well, thank you for it. Well, the other point I'll just add real quick is uh, that same day I was getting some of these uh, uh, vendor and wholesale magazines, there was a guy's medical things there. And I opened that one on curiosity, and sure enough, there's his social security number and everything else. So, once again, be careful where you uh, uh, deposit information that can, can identify. In this guy's case, I ripped out his information and later deposited it in that trash, so nobody was going to defraud him. That's right. Thank careful you. of you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lauro, go right ahead, sir. For those, of us that are, for those of us that are here, uh, I'm not uh, representing the uh, Mules on Wheels, but I'm an advocate of the Mules on Wheels. Uh, the federal government, the state, and the city are trying to keep you at home. So uh, there is a, a benefit if you don't need it. Somebody else. Uh, can use it. You, uh, among here, we know a lot of people that, that are a little bit incapacitated. Uh, and uh, so, one of the best things you can do is start donating to Meals on Wheels. Uh, a dollar can go uh, uh, very far. So, uh, yes, uh, for those of you that need it, they have very good meals. They are uh, uh, nutritional meals, so uh, I'm saying, you know, let's look towards uh, servicing somebody, and uh, Mills and Will do a good job. They have very good cooks. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. They're absolutely right. We're going to have to shut down. We're going to stay around and talk to those. I've got a few closing remarks. I'd like to emphasize that. Although this is a very serious issue, it has received nation, nationwide attention recently. And although other types of abuse may get more attention, the abuse of the elderly has a significant consequence 
for the elderly themselves, and often the effects last for their, the rest of their lives. And however, we are very optimistic that together we can come up with strategies and methods to better safeguard our senior citizens. There's some simple steps that are, that are to help seniors and their friends, caregivers and relatives to prevent fraudulent activity. Simply, we'd like to have you talk to us about any issues or concerns that you'd like to be clarified or addressed so that we can help work together to build a better future for Texas. You know, some of you are familiar with our office. We're in Wonderland Mall. If Wonderland Mall is convenient to you, come by. Walk by. We're there. We open at 8.30. We close at 5.30 during the week. We, you don't need an appointment to, to stick your head in, say hello. Someone will meet, that, meet and talk to you. We're there Saturdays 11 to 2. Is that correct? Uh, well, most Saturdays, right? Those that recognize that these new laws and regulations are possible, we're open to new ideas to provide solutions for you and your family. During the 2017 session, we were successful in passing House Bill 3019. It helps protect those who can't defend themselves, and this necessary piece of legislation prosecutes those that are guilty of causing injury either to a child, an elderly, or a disabled individual. So we're going to continue to safeguard our, our citizens from the community from relentless individuals that continue to prey on them who are defenseless and need laws to protect them. Uh, we have a sign that you saw in our office when you came in. This says, this office belongs to the people of San Antonio. It's because we are public servants. Would everybody in the blue shirt, everybody on my team, would you all come up to the front, please? I want to, I want to introduce your, the team here. Um, and, and so let's see here. Everybody come on up. Everyone you see in the blue shirt is members of, the, of my Senate team. And uh, I want you all to, Jacob, why don't you stand up so they can see that you're on the team, too. Um, our constituents, you're the number one priority for this. I want to like, I want to thank you all for coming out. I also want to thank uh, Marta Valdez with the Northside Activity Center for hosting us. Marta, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, yes, let's give her a round of applause. I want to thank Northside Independent School District Superintendent Brian Woods and the entire board. Uh, this is a publicly owned facility. This is owned by the school district and I think it's always good to use facilities that our taxpayers have already paid for and they work hard uh, to improve the school district. I also want to thank each and every one of our senior centers for taking time to work with our population and caring for everybody. Special thanks uh, to the Lopez Center, St. Luke's, District 5, Madonna Center, Bethel, HEB, SAWS, and the Madonna Community Center. We are very committed to solving problems and serving you because you are who are you are our bosses. Everyone up here works for you. If you have any questions that something that didn't come up uh, that you want us to address, please call us. Would you write our oh there are numbers up there. 733-6604. Remember you never need an appointment to come see us. We're in Wonderland Mall. If you want to know where, we're under Ross Dress for Less. So if you know where Luby's is on Fredericksburg Road, go in the entrance right in front of Luby's, park underground, through the little tunnel, first office on the left. All right, last thing, November 5th, there's an election. These 10 things are going to be on the ballot. These are the constitutional amendments. I want all of you, I'm sure none of us miss elections in this room, uh, but these constitutional amendments will either pass or fail, and you want to have your voice heard. The other thing is this election is going to be the first time we vote with a new system. So it's going to be a good time to get yourself uh, familiar with a new voting system. Uh, we have these flyers. If you need any more questions, we will be happy to make them. Let's give our panelists, the sheriff, the, the judge, Vasquez, the DA's office, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you all. I mean, we've got a hardworking sheriff. I want to thank Adult Protection Service, Ms. Cortez. The boss came out. My good friend, uh, Phil Kazin, former Judge Kazin, the DA's office. Judge Veronica Vasquez, thank you for everything. I look forward to working with you on this task force that you're asking us to lead up. And Lieutenant Booth, thank you for everything you're doing with your team. All right. Thank you all very much.